incredibly grateful, humbled, and honored to be able to introduce our speaker today. Um, Sage Dyer has a fasc fascinating story and has been on an incredible journey. Um, she has her master's degree in psychology. She's already written two books, um, one titled Goodbye Bumps. In her recent book, she co-authored with her sister, Serena, in which they highlight um, the incredible principles that have been passed down from their father, um, Wayne Dyer, who many of us um, have studied. And, you know, the reason this is such an absolute honor to introduce you, Sage, is your dad had a tremendous impact on me in my life. Um, there was this point in time when I was really, really struggling and somebody sent me your father's YouTube videos. And um, I remember feeling the love that he radiated. Um, and I started, you know, tapping into that love for my own healing and transformation. Um, and he started teaching me all these incredible different principles that created the foundation for me to start a whole new entire way of life. You know, he taught me that there's no justified resentments. Um, he taught me that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. He taught me about harmony and balance through the teachings of the Tao. He taught me the power of giving. Um, basically, uh, don't look outside yourself for things where the answer is actually inside yourself. He taught me just so many different things. And um, through his amazing love, I was able to find a pathway out into an entirely new way of life. So I know this is the case for so many people in this group and in the world. Um, and it's really cool that you're like taking it upon yourself to share his message and continue to pass that on. So I'm so honored and grateful to have you here. <laughs> so the mic is yours. Thank you so much for being here, Sage. Well, thank you for having me and um, for that awesome introduction and that meditation that I'm like buzzing from that I got to snap out of here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what you were just saying, the, the love um, so many people ask me and my siblings, what was it like being raised by Wayne Dyer? What was it like? And for a long time, I couldn't really answer that very well because it's the only upbringing I had. These are the only parents I had. Um, so it was hard for me to answer that question. But now that I've gotten older and I have kids of my own and I um, have seen, you know, friends and how they were brought up and one thing I could say that just stands out to me is uh, <clears throat> it was just an environment of love all the time. You know, there was, my parents didn't uh, put pressures on us to be anything. We didn't, there was no expectation that we went to college or didn't go to college. There was no expectation that we even follow in or believe in the teachings that my dad taught. You know, he, he, presented them to us and he talked about it all the time but there was no pressure to be a certain way you didn't we didn't have to date anybody that came from a certain place or you know there was just a an environment of acceptance and love the only expectation was to be loving towards each other and towards um ourselves I mean I'm one of eight kids I'm the youngest so you know to foster this home of 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 love but other than that we were free to be who we were. And um, I think that's such a gift that, you know, not everybody is given in their childhoods. And I'm so grateful that I was given that. Um, but aside from that, I, I would say that growing up, you know, I was obviously immersed in my dad's teachings, all the things that you just uh, stated that impacted you. I was immersed in all of that my whole life. I, if I'm being honest, would say that I was a believer in some of it, but I was also skeptical of some of it. And I also don't think it applied to me very much when I was younger because, you know, I hadn't had any struggles yet where my faith was tested or, you know, I had a great um, upbringing. And until my dad 
passed away at uh, when I was 25 years old, almost six years ago. Um, I hadn't lost anybody that I was close to. So a lot of the things he taught about, especially in his like last few years before he left his physical body was about death and the other realm and how we can tap into that while we're here, while we're alive. But I would hear it and it would be just maybe, I don't, you know, I don't know, it didn't apply to me. So when he passed away, I found myself um, really, really grief stricken and and of course, and that's natural, and I have no judgment around that. I think that grief is normal and healthy and natural. But there came a point for me where I was just sort of stuck in in the grief. And I was on this cycle of like, I would get really down and um, be really just deep in it, thinking about all the never agains, all the should haves, all the could haves, all the fear around this idea that my dad was gone, you know, and um and I found myself at a crossroads, like, am I going to believe that he's gone for good? That's such a hard, it's almost an impossible thing to conceive of someone you knew your whole life is just gone in an instant. Or am I going to uh, follow in what he taught me to know to be true, which is that, uh, and he, him and my mom, since I was a little kid, talked about how they were excited for, he called it the next phase. Um, excited for the next phase, how it's this immersion in love and immersion in um, just knowing all the things that while we're here, we might question. He used to say, you know, here on earth and your human body is the classroom. And then you return home one day and you know it, you know? And so he used to talk about how he was excited for that day. And my mom still talks about that. And um, I just was at a place where am I going to am I going to go there? Am I going to have that excitement for him that he has finally reached this place where he wanted to be? Um, not that he, he loved his life and he valued his life, but he was also excited for the next phase. And I think you can have both. And um, I had a moment one time, I was actually in the shower where I was thinking all these fearful thoughts and like fear-based thoughts that didn't bring me peace, that brought me nothing but turmoil. And um, I had this thought of just call dad, he'll make it better. And then it's like this realization that you'll never do that again. And then you're, you know, you just become devastated all over again. And I said, okay, Sage, you've got to stop doing this. Cause I had, I was in this cycle uh, for a couple of weeks. And um, so I said, you've got to stop doing this. It's not serving you. And I said, you've, you've had a lifetime of knowing and growing up with dad. What would he say to you right now, if you could talk to him? And I felt like I heard my dad speak to me in my head, which was not something that I was necessarily open to at that time, but, um, or maybe I was open to it, but I would have questioned it, you know, and I heard him say, okay, Sage, you can either make this the worst thing that's ever happened to you. You can feel bad for yourself. You can, um, I was it was August 30th when he passed away and my semester for school, I was still in my master's program was supposed to start like within a week, like September 5th or 6th or something. And I was grappling with this idea of, should I go back? So I, he was saying to me, um, you know, you could take the semester off. You could, you could continue to think all these never agains, all these should haves, which are just silly and they're not bringing you peace. Or you could choose to believe and choose to view this as an opportunity to grow and to get to know me from the other side and to deepen your, your faith and your roots. And um, so I, from, from that moment, I mean, I felt so connected to my dad in that moment in the shower that I started to have faith. And I started to, you know, I, I remembered how, cause you said there are no justified resentments. Like I felt like I was reminded of his teachings in any situation, you can choose to be the victim of your circumstances or the student of your circumstances. And I was at first being the victim. And again, I wanna say that grief is important. I'm not saying that you should have any judgment around the grieving that you're doing, but I wanted to transition into being the student. And um, because I think when you make that choice, you know, when you're in circumstances that are outside of your control, when you choose to not see it as poor me, but instead, what can I learn from this? How can I become the student of the situation that I'm in that's completely outside of my control? You're choosing to grow. 
and you're choosing to see it as an opportunity because when you make that choice, it's like life is not happening to you. It's responding to you. So when you choose uh, to see it that way, your life unfolds from there. And when you choose to stay stuck, your life will continue to unfold in, in, in the way that it has been. So um, making that choice, because it's always a choice, I started to, and I, it wasn't a choice I made and never looked back. It was just a choice that I became open to. And of course the grief still happened in waves, but, but I started to wake up every morning with, and have an intention of, okay, how can I learn more from my dad, even though he's not here? How can I um, start to see him as still being accessible to me? Not that, not that he's gone, but that he's just in another form, which is what he taught me to know and believe. And after I did that, I started to experience a lot of miracles and synchronicities and signs from him that I had previously been closed off to because I, um, because I just wasn't ready to see it. Excuse me, I get so out of breath because I'm nine months pregnant <laughs> for anyone who missed that at the beginning, but I've got a baby pushing on my lungs. But anyway, um, so I, I started to experience so many signs and, and miracles. And one of them that I want to share was more of a, just a synchronicity and a, and a knowing that, um, that my dad, that, because my dad used to say, you know, we all come here with a round trip ticket and we question so much, uh, or, or, sorry, excuse me. We celebrate so much the birth aspect of the, of the round trip ticket. You know, we continue to celebrate our birthdays for our whole lives. We, um, you know, we honor this day that we were born. We don't question it at all. And, but then the return ticket gets called and, and often if it's for a loved one or as you fear your own coming up, it's this date and this event that's surrounded by fear. And um, you can flip that on its head and see it as a, as a, a divinely orchestrated event that's on purpose the same way that your birth was on purpose. And so I, I started to read my dad's books and I, and I had just been the three weeks before he passed away, I had been in Australia and New Zealand with him where he was giving lectures every couple of days. And so I was really immersed in his work. Um, 48 hours after I got back from that trip, he passed away. So I had been immersed in a lot of this and I just started to explore it. And I, my dad was really into numbers when he was alive, synchronicity through numbers, you know, his favorite number was 18 because he said it stood for one infinity or one infinite source that we all originate from and that we all return to. And he was also into seeing the, the summer before he passed away, he was really into seeing the clock at 1111. And he made it a game for all of us. He said, like, oh, I was out there in Maui with him because it was my summer break from school. And he said, okay, anytime you see the clock at 1111, if you're not with me, you've got to text me so that I see it at 1111, or at least I have the message that shows that I got it at 1111, you know? So it became like a game and he was really into it. What was cool about that is that it just showed me because I started to see the clock at 1111 all the time. And sometimes I'd already be asleep before 11, 11 at night, but I would wake up and look at the clock and it would be 1111. It started happening all the time. And it was just a lesson and you know, what you put your attention on grows and expands. And I had put my attention on this 1111 and now I'm seeing it all the time. Whereas previously I, who knows if I saw it or not, but it didn't hold any value to me. So, um, but so anyway, when he passed away on August 30th, I said, okay, because I like to, I, I was like testing his work. I said, if all of this is true, what you study about and what you taught about, and if, if I know you, you loved numbers, you wouldn't have just died on any day. If it was really on purpose, you would have picked a meaningful day to choose to depart. And, um, you know, I added up the numbers. They didn't really add up to anything. And I couldn't figure it out at first, but um, I decided to read his book, I Can See Clearly Now, which is a memoir that he wrote. And what's interesting about that is he was like 73, a couple years before he passed away, he started writing this memoir. And I um, and my siblings, we were all like, why are you writing a memoir? You're, you're gonna have to write another one in 10 years. You know, it's this, and he, because we said, you're 73, you're healthy, you know, all of that. And he said, I don't know, but I'm just being called to write it. So I am, he said the, this, the urge that I have to write this, which is not a type of book he's ever written before, 
um, was so overpowering for him that he decided to do it. Not decided to do it. He was describing it as he didn't have a choice. Um, he just had to write this book. So I wanted to read it because I witnessed him writing it and how um, called he was to do that work. And uh, he had a lot of neck problems at that time, but he was still sitting at the desk every day for several hours. Um, so, I, so I read the book and I uh, was still searching for the meaning behind this August 30th. In the book, there's a part of it where he talks about his relationship with his father, who his father, left his family when when he was born so he never knew his father his father was an alcoholic and he um was not a good husband to my dad's mother and he walked out on him and his two brothers this was in the 40s so my grandmother my dad's mother had no choice but to put her children in foster care and in orphanages because she could not afford to provide for them on her own and my dad grew up really um resenting well at first searching for his father because he wanted to because he hated him he had so much hatred in his heart for this man who how could you walk out on your wife and your three sons when um you know when they needed you so badly and so much of his life was impacted by that decision from his father and his mother did eventually get them back together uh and raised as she got remarried and she was able to get them back together as a family but Anyway, he grew up with so much rage in his heart for this man who was his father, who he never knew. And he said he would have nightmares about finding him and beating him up or yelling at him, you know, just uh, all of that. And it consumed him for a while. And when he was um, older, he, he looked for him all over the place. He knew he was still alive, but then he, he had been searching and searching. He actually found out that his father had passed away a couple years before. So he had been searching and he had been dead for a couple of years. And through a series of um, really cool and strange coincidences that I don't want to get into, but you could read about them in the book, he was able to find his father's grave because it's a, it's a very long story, but he eventually found where his father was buried. And, you know, because this, uh, this is, I believe in the 60s or early 70s, you couldn't Google things and it just wasn't quite as simple. So it took him a lot to figure out where his father was grieved, especially because he was buried as an indignant. I don't know exactly what that means, but um, there wasn't records basically. And he found his father's grave and it was in Biloxi, Mississippi. And he took a trip out there and he went there with every intention of hissing on his father's grave, literally, and screaming at him and having this conversation that he never got to have. And when he got to the grave, he did that. And he, um, he, you know, he did all the angry stuff. He did the yelling and the shouting and the, he got out his rage. But uh, when he went to leave, he started to walk back towards his car. And he said that he just felt this overwhelmingly strong and powerful urge and need to go back to the grave. So he turned around and he walked back to the grave and he was overcome with um, just a feeling of love and forgiveness out of nowhere. He had no intention of having those feelings towards his father, nor had he ever experienced them for his father before. But in that moment, he said, I, I, he was so overcome with this feeling of love and forgiveness that he said out loud to his dad, I love you, I love you. And he sobbed and he cried and he got, he just felt a, feeling he had never felt before for this man and he said from this moment forward I send you love I forgive you I'm sorry that I have had all this hatred for you my whole life and um he left that gravesite a transformed man he was like 35 and he from that point in his life his life took a whole new it took a turn his life took on a whole new meaning. He got out of a job that he wasn't happy with. He wrote his first book. He got out of a relationship he was unhappy in. And he met my mother, which is how I got here and my siblings. And um, he, his, his life just changed completely. He no longer had these nightmares. He was no longer filled with this rage. And at the end of the chapter in that book, where he, in his book, I can see clearly now where he writes about this. He says, if you were to ask me what were the most significant events of my life? It was the events that took place on August 30th, 1970, 
three, I believe it was, 76, 1976. And I froze in my tracks as I read that because August 30th is the day that my dad passed away. And I was looking for the meaning behind this date. And it happened to be the most significant date in his life by his own words, by his own account. And I stopped and I, I mean, I was so overwhelmed with emotion by discovering that, but um, I told everyone in my family, but I thought to myself, what is he trying to tell me or tell us by choosing that date to depart? If nothing's an accident and everything's on purpose and divinely timed and orchestrated, what, what is he telling me? And I felt like I knew that what he was saying was, August 30th is the day that my relationship, his relationship with his father changed to take on a whole new meaning. It's not the day that it ended. It's the day that it changed. And it's the day that his life took on a whole new meaning and, and also his relationship with his father. And I felt like what he was saying to us as his children is, this is not the day that your relationship with your father ends. It's the day that it changes to take on a whole new meaning. And you can choose to see it either way. So when I read that, I thought, okay, August 30th doesn't mark the day my dad died. It marks, nor does it mark the day that my relationship with him ended. It marks the day that it changed to take on a whole new meaning. And um, once I realized once I read that and, and had that sort of knowing, uh, so many things unfolded for me from there. I really was able to shift into that space of no longer being a skeptic, but really being a believer and being excited about what else can I discover, you know, about my dad's departure and where he is now and how can I communicate with him? And um, I started to receive so many incredible signs, but I also just started to, I grew up a little, you know, I felt like I saw the world differently. I had more compassion towards other people. And um, so sometimes, you know, the biggest storms of your life, for me losing my dad, which at first felt uh, insurmountable, has become a beautiful thing that I can celebrate. And of course I miss my dad and I would want to get him back if I could, but, um, but it really is a thing that I think of with uh, love and joy now towards him and towards the whole experience, because I feel him with me all the time, you know, and I feel him when I went after those sorts of things started to happen. And I had that realization about the date. And um, I started to write in the same sort of fashion that he was writing. When he wrote, I can see clearly now where he was just called to do it, I started to feel called to write. And I didn't have an intention of writing a book. I just uh, wanted to write. And I, um, and I was in grad school, my husband and I had started a business and he was my boyfriend at the time, but we had started a business. I had a lot going on, but I was making the time to write because I was so called to do it. And, um, and eventually I learned that my sister Serena was also writing and we didn't know it at the time. A friend of ours said, why, you know, once I realized like what I'm writing could maybe be a book, like, I started talking to people about it. Somebody said, why don't you, you know, you guys are both writing, don't put out competing books, see if you can put out one book. So we compared notes and what Serena and I had written um, really fit very well together. And there were common themes and threads throughout that we decided to combine the book, which is how the knowing came about. Um, and it's been out for like a month now. And it's just been such a beautiful experience. The whole writing experience was because I found myself listening to my dad's lectures during the day and jotting down notes that excited me and, and then just sitting down and writing them. And I, but actually at a certain point, we both sort of fell off and stopped writing and we hadn't gotten a book deal yet, but, um, but we just, you know, our lives got in the way basically after about a year or so of really being into it. And uh, a little bit after that, I found out that I was pregnant. I had gotten married and um, I, we, I was living in New York City. I was living this life that I was very happy with, you know, young in New York, traveling. Um, you know, I had graduated grad school. I don't know. I was just in a good place. And I found out that I was pregnant. And I, if I'm being honest, I was sort of devastated at first because 
I knew what I was doing. I shouldn't say that it was a surprise. I mean, I'm an adult. I knew what me and my husband were doing and I knew what could happen. And part of me wanted to have a baby, but when it actually happened and it happened very quickly, I felt uh, really scared for the first time since my dad had left. I just felt like, what did I do? Like my whole life is about to change and I wasn't welcoming the changes and I wasn't in a good um, headspace about it. And I felt guilty about that because I recognized that well, number one, this soul chose me to be his mother and came to me at the, the perfect timing, but I couldn't embrace that idea. And he was inside of me. And could he feel that or in some way? And I felt guilty about that. And I felt guilty about the fact that so many people struggle to get pregnant. And here I was taking this miracle for granted, but I couldn't shake it. You know, that's just how I felt. And, um, but at a certain point, I, re- I started to the same way that I did after my dad passed, I just said, you know, you can either become stuck and a victim in these circumstances, or you can choose to just flip this on its head and change the, you know, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So I, I decided to do that in my pregnancy and things really did change. Um, Well, first of all, I had this belief when I found out I was pregnant that I had only eight months left to get this book out because I could never have a career once I have a kid. I just bought into this notion that is not true at all. But, um, but at the time it felt very true. And I thought I have eight months left and then I'll never have a career. So it actually lit the fire under me to finish the book, get the, you know, I started contacting the publishers. I said to Serena, we're going to do this now, because if we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. And we ended up um, getting this book out there. And um, because I was pregnant and then after my son was born, you know, I realized that everything that I had been thinking was just so not true. I mean, my life didn't end when he was born. My life has changed and it's taken on a whole new meeting and it's been a beautiful experience and I love him so much. I mean, he's the greatest thing that ever happened to me, but I, I couldn't get in that headspace until he was there. And I remember hearing the quote, well, we've all heard this quote a million times. There is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. And I had heard that throughout my life. It's from the Tao Te Ching. Um, It's on fortune cookies and it's a common phrase. And it struck me after my son was born, you know, there is no way to happiness, you know, staying without children and not single because I was married, but, you know, single in the sense that I could do whatever I wanted with my time. Um, was not the way to happiness because I wasn't any more happy then than I am now. In fact, I think I'm far more fulfilled now, but also becoming a mother was not the way to happiness. Uh, There is no actual way to happiness. Happiness is the way. I bring the happiness to my life as a mother to the life that I was now in that I felt like I didn't, wasn't ready for. And therefore, it is a happy life. And it was a really, it's just been such a big uh, lesson and turning point for me in my life. Like it's always your choice. It's always your choice to bring the energy of joy and happiness into your life, which is so much of what my dad taught was that, you know, feeling good is feeling God. So when you're feeling anything but that, do what you can to shift back. It doesn't mean you're not, I don't feel personally that you could feel good all the time. We're human beings and we have emotions and things happen, but when you can shift back into a place of feeling good, do what you have to do to do that because that's when um, you're in the flow. That's when you're allowing your, the, the blessings in your life to come to you versus resisting them. Cause I think uh, I remember um, I was once in the car with my dad and the song, I Hope You Dance by Leon Womack came on. And I think we've all heard that song. If you haven't, you should listen to it, but it's full of a lot of beautiful cliche lines that are very true. And um, it's a feel good song. The song came on and my dad said, um, I want you to listen to this song. And I want you to tell me if, uh, tell me, he said, I agree with every single line in this song, except for one. And I want you to tell me if you can figure out which one I don't agree with. So we listened to the song. I was like in my early twenties or maybe even a teenager. And um, 
listened to the song and I don't think I got it right, but he told me afterwards, you know, the one line that I don't agree with is when she says, you should never settle for the path of least resistance because he said, you should always take the path of least resistance because when the universe is offering you resistance and putting, you know, red lights and roadblocks in your way, it's often it's for a reason, you know, and you're going against the flow. Take a look at what are you trying to force right now? That's not, because that happens in so many aspects of our lives, jobs, careers, relationships, you know, when you're forcing something, you're creating like a counter force against it. And you're basically going because so many times, it's like what I was doing in my pregnancy with my son, I was resisting it and resisting it. And, um, I, I robbed myself of a joy that I could have had from day one, because it turns out that it was a beautiful thing for me that was coming. And, um, and it's been everything that it was supposed to be, but I resisted it. And I created, you know, this, this part of my pregnancy to be unenjoyable because of that, where I could have just flowed with it. And, um, and it makes me think of this after he, after all of that, all of this, these things that happened and my son was born and I realized like happiness is the way. And I just made that my mantra because there is, it can be hard in early motherhood. You're stuck at home and you're sort of isolated. And I just kept saying, happiness is the way I bring the happiness. This is temporary the way I'm feeling, but I can bring the eternal happiness. And I started to think about this word purpose that, um, that so many people talk about. What's your purpose? Are you living your purpose? And I realized that I don't really like that idea or notion or word because I don't think that we come here in life and we have one purpose that we need to find and figure out what it is and then start living it. Because first of all, I think that's a really crazy amount of pressure. And as you get older, you think like, well, now I'm in my thirties or my forties or my fifties. And I still don't know what my purpose was. How can I find my purpose? And I don't, I don't think that's a healthy way to think. And what I've realized since having children or having a child, one on the way, and now having a career that I love and enjoy is that, um, and having so many other things in my life that I love, my friends and my family and traveling and reading. Um, I think that we have, you can find purpose in everything that you're doing. When I sit here and I do something like this, an interview or a podcast or you know a cool meeting like this, there I have a big purpose in that, and I'm fulfilling my purpose, and I feel like I'm on purpose. I feel good about it. But when this is over and I go out into the living room and I'm taking care of my son and I spend the Sunday with my family, that's also my purpose. And choosing to see it that way has brought me so much peace in like, and having a balance in my life, there's per, you know, cause I hate this idea that, well, then what, when you retire, do you stop living your, is your purpose done? So the rest of your life is just purposeless. Absolutely not. I think that you can, there, you, there's a purpose that it's a journey. It's not a destination and it, it's going to shift to take on new meanings throughout your life. And I just hope to, my goal for my life is to stay in a place of excitement about all the places that my purpose takes me and how my purpose will take on new meanings at different stages in my life. And um, that's just one thing I've been thinking a lot about lately. So I wanted to say it, but I, I don't know, we could shift to questions now or. Um... Wow. Yeah, that was so, so good. <laughs> Thank oh, you for thank sharing. You. That, was, that was amazing. Um, so yeah, we will shift the questions. Um, I loved everything you touched on. There's so much there. Um, I was thinking a lot about your connection with your father since he's passed, which is such an incredible thing because I was going through this time in my life where I was like a really bad alcoholic and uh, my grandfather died. Who I, pro I had like, I looked up to him similarly to how you look up to your father and it like killed me. And I was like, this is done, you know? Um, I, I didn't get to be there for him or say goodbye in the ways, you know, like I'm an alcoholic at the time of his death. Like, what does he think of me, you know? And um, it made me sad. But one day when I was in my meditation, all of a sudden he just came to me 
<laughs> you know, and he basically told me like, this is just the start of our relationship. And from that point forward, I, I just, I've had the best relationship with my grandfather. My mom's on the call and I don't think I've ever said this, but I've had a better relationship now with my grandfather since he's passed. So it's, it's such a cool thought. And to that point, one thing that's really interesting is one day I was deep in meditation and your father came to me too. <laughs> and he was with <laughs> Lao Tzu. And um, he basically was saying stuff along the lines of like, be open to everything attached to nothing. Um, but he, he was telling me just serve and just like, just, just give it all away. Just give everything you have. Keep doing what you're doing, kid. It's pretty much what, what the energy I was getting. And it felt so good. Um, so I was just wondering if you could speak to that energy of your dad, because it's the one that's really like had such a huge impact, like the service work he did and how we really like gave it away. Cause that, that always blew my mind. Some of his stories. Yeah, no, I mean, my dad uh, made it his mantra. Um, how may I serve? How may I serve? He used to say that to me. I mean, one thing he used to say to me growing up a lot was, um, you know, I, I think you're going to, you could do my work one day, but you have too much of a tendency to want to be right rather than kind. And until you get to a point in your life where you're ready to be kind rather than right, you know, he always used to say, if you can choose to be right or to be kind, you should always choose kindness. And I was just like an argumentative bratty little kid. I mean, I had seven older siblings, so I give myself that, but, um, but it, but it's always about service to others, you know, and, and so he, especially in his last few years that he was alive, he used to say that, how may I serve? How may I serve? That shifts you into that space of, you know, because like, if you're, uh, there's the quote from the Tao, the sage, not myself, but a wise person is kind to the kind and kind to the unkind because kindness is their nature and so when you serve another it's not because you do it from a place of what can I get in return you do it from a place of I am just a loving kind giving being and that's what's inside of me it's not between um I remember my dad had this example of he was in the car and he gave money to a homeless person who was begging at the light and whoever he was in the car with said oh you know, they're just going to go buy drugs. Why would you do that? You're contributing to. And he said, but it's not between me and them. It's not between what this person chooses to do with that money. That's up to him. It's between me and God and me and the universe. And I give because I'm a giving person. What he does with the money is his choice. But I want to be a person of God and of service. So I just be that person that person and I think that you know you with things like that it's like if you were generous if you weren't generous when you're poor you're probably not going to be generous when you're rich because that's just your nature I mean there are people who have so little and would give what they have and there are people who have so much and it's just not in their nature and I think it's so important to shift it to a place of being a person of service and generosity and how may I serve you? Like a lot of what he taught about, uh, he wrote a whole book about the prayer of St. Francis and how it's a, oh, sorry, because I'm on my phone. Okay. <laughs> because I'm on my phone, a call came through, but um, the prayer of St. Francis, how it's actually a technology. It's not just a prayer, you know, you're, you're tapping into this, you know, you say to God, make me an instrument of thy peace. You don't go to God and say, give me peace. You say, make me peaceful, make me a person of peace. And that invites peace into your life. But you've got to take responsibility for your role in it. You don't just go around saying, I want peace. I want peace. Give me peace. Make me an instrument of peace. Bring peace to yourself. Bring peace to everybody. So I think it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a complicated question, but it's a, such an important thing to bring into our lives is being of service, being what it is we want to seek in the world, becoming it for ourselves first. That was unbelievable. So thank you. That's exactly what I was <laughs> looking for. I see uh, Rhonda with her hand up. Hi, Sage. 
Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, my heart is enlarged. And oh, thank of course, you. I was so in love with your father and got to uh, meet him, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago at the Hay House event in, at the Javits Center. Okay. And I got there I was like probably hour, there. <laughs> I really got there like an hour yeah. early so that I could be in the front row and I had a present for him and I brought him, I don't, I don't have mine. I always wear my mala beads and I gave him mala beads. I remember him having to like lean over to get it. And I was like, I always wondered, I wonder where they went, but I was like, I'm sure he gave them to somebody. But um, as what, what came to me, I have a little grandson, my first, he's uh, five months old. So what would you say is like your number one method of, of parenting that, that, that you think everyone should embrace? Is, is there like one, one thing? Yeah, I mean, um, by the way, I love your necklace and I have, where is it? It's right behind me. I think I have the same one. And just to tell you about my dad, he, mm -hmm. uh, people yeah. sent him photos and um, things all the time and he kept them, <laughs> believe it or not. So he, I mean, our walls were filled with photos of people who were not in our family like all over the I gave him a picture of where I'm from which I don't know if you can see right. that okay and wrote Beautiful. a little note on the back so that, that would like I would die laughing that's so funny it, it, it very well may have been up on the wall <laughs> we would say you know it would be like his grandkids on the wall and then somebody else's kids that we don't know <laughs> but um <laughs> one thing that my dad a, a poem by Khalil Gibran that uh he always quoted and that I now have on a canvas in my son's room it starts with uh, your children are not your children they are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself and they come through you but not for you and it keeps going but um, that's my favorite part of it because I think it's just so important to remember when one thing I try to remember and it's not always easy and I only have a two-year-old but it's it's that he came here your children come here with their own lives to live and we're not here to put our our pressures and our beliefs and our desires on them you know a lot of people I didn't go to college so my kids are going to go to college but and it's not just about college I mean it's so much more than that um, but just recognize it, allowing your children to be who they came here to be and I think the best way to do that is to just love them for who they are you know and remember, they came through you, but not for you, not from you. They're, they're, they're here for themselves. They have their own lives to live. Our grandma used to say, I, you guide and you step aside. <laughs> like, you know, you do your best to set a good example and you do your best to um, just foster a loving environment. And then you let them choose their lives. That's what I hope to do. I mean, I'm a young mother. You probably know a lot more about it than I do. Um, you know, if you've got grown up kids, but that's yeah. that's my goal right now from my perspective. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, who else has a question? I think I saw Joe with his hand up. Actually, you can let Jeff go, brother. I always oh, I talk. Let Jeff go. Yeah, yeah, let Jeff go. I always talk, man. I would like to let the community <laughs> talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm kind of new to this. I didn't know your father back in March, but I kind of found my purpose. But kind of while I was getting there, like my grandma, she passed away two years ago, and I kind of knew the significance of a cardinal. So I started looking what it meant. So did you ever, you know, like have a spirit guide or, you know, kind of look into that, you know, help you find answers? Yeah, absolutely. Um it's funny you say birds because my a cardinal my sister sky was having um this white bird show up at her door all the time and it would literally knock on her window and then we went to a psychic medium who's also a friend and she said your dad is saying he's coming to you as the bird and um you know she wouldn't have known that there was a, a bird that sky was always talking about but also feathers i mean somebody told me your loved ones come to you as feathers and or they, they just show you that they're with you by presenting feathers in your path. And I started to find feathers everywhere. I live in New York City and I felt like every corner that I turned, I was, there was a feather on my path and I would um, 
I actually Googled like, is it molting season in New York? Because I was finding so many and I felt like, but he's always there and I wasn't paying attention. And um, yeah, and we, on the cover of our book, we put a feather because of that. We wrote about it a little bit, just, you know, when you become open to these signs and to the idea that your loved ones are still with you from the other side, they start to show you, but it starts with that openness, I think. But yeah, no, I love, I love receiving signs, animal sign. I'm always looking for signs, so. Okay, that was awesome. Cause yeah, I just started and I started a book. I know Randy, oh gosh, was, you know, finding the spirit guide. And it was like the very first meditation, you know, kind of figuring I already had an idea what my sign was and I was right. It was a tiger because I'm a Sagittarius and my third eye, it can be very active at times. Wow. But I just kind of already knew somehow from my childhood, like just, you know, a tiger being my favorite animal I'm not you know really sure why but it just was and then right kind of like with this book it was a funny thing there was a cardinal on the front of it so it's just kind of you know my grandma's like well follow the cardinal almost right and then showing you that she's with yep. you and yeah when she presents yes. it I think yeah I love it especially when you feel called to a certain animal or sign I think that's absolutely for a reason you should go with it Thank you, Jeff. Uh, does anyone else have a question for Sage? Is it Joe there? Yeah, I'll hop. I'll, I'll definitely. Mine is more of a gratitude, and uh, I just want to thank you, Sage, for your introspection because your introspection seems and your father's introspection has created so much wisdom, like in allowing you yourselves to go there and allowing said your dad had a huge impact on not just his life and our lives. We were doing a, a listening to uh, his interpretation of the Tao Te Ching. We were doing it weekly and we were literally, or daily, he was sending out the message. We were listening to it as a group. And it's just the transformations that have, that have occurred because of uh, your introspection and your vulnerability to your introspection, even just yours today. So much I've learned from you in this sitting. I was in tears for the whole first half of the, <laughs> what you were talking, because it rang so true. Like there was so much truth and it felt like it was, being spoken directly towards to me and right. i love that because you're how you speak that nothing's an accident how your dad spoke it's it's i can feel like this conversation was for me there was a lot to hear and that i needed to hear and uh i'm just very grateful for you so thank you so, oh, well, so thank much thank you i just feel so grateful to be in a place uh to be sharing my introspections because you know there's still that part of me that's like, well, who am I to sit here and talk for 30, 40 minutes? And, but, um, but I enjoy it and I'm grateful that anybody wants to listen. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, that is cool. Joe, uh, I, I started the Stout Te Ching group where a bunch of us were listening daily to the teachings of your father through the Tao Te Ching. And Joe and I were like in this group and, um, I didn't even know him. Somebody just sent him my way. And because of that group and your father's wisdom, him and I connected. And now he's like my best friend. <laughs> so <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Right. Um, I think Randy, I saw Randy with his hand up. Good morning, Sage. Yeah, that, that's, it was wonderful. Um, I was one of those people that uh, always uh, refused to take the, the path of least resistance. And uh, uh, that really uh, hit home for me. Um, my dad was uh, the center of probably most traumatic as well as the, the most wonderful and beautiful uh, events in terms of my life. And, and uh, the Cardinals hit home. Uh, but uh, I've always felt like, well, most of my life I, I was frustrated because I couldn't find my purpose. And again, I took the, uh, the, the hardest path. But uh, when my dad passed, uh, also in August, uh, 16 years ago, that's when I, uh, things started turning around. The Cardinals came, my mom and dad as Cardinals, banging into my window. I would move. <laughs> they would follow to come to the new house, wow. banging into the window. When I finally started paying attention and realized that it's okay that I don't know what my purpose is, is 
as long as I'm on that journey, and like you said, the journey could be uh, very much part of your purpose. And and right. so then that's they quit banging on the windows, but they're here every day almost though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's beautiful. I think because I I do I think it's such a pressure to put on yourself. I have to find my purpose, but your life is your purpose, you know. Um, you're not going to find one thing. We start out as children and that has purpose in it too. And, and with the path of least resistance, I think, um, right, there's this, especially in our society, there's this notion that if you're not working hard, then it, you're, not, uh, you're not worthy of rewards. But, um, and that doesn't mean that you don't work hard. It doesn't mean that you don't, you know, you're not disciplined and you work hard towards your goals. It just means that it doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't have to be impossible you're not climbing this mountain and and when things come easily to you you should go with that I mean that's what I try to remember what whatever is presented to me in my life um I just try to remember the word surrender because when it's outside of your control it's outside of your control anyway and you can resist it and resist it and it's going to just create more resistance and or you can flow with it and just see well what does the universe have in store for me down this road then and like I said, it doesn't mean you don't go after your dreams. It just means you pay attention to the, to where you're being called to go, you know? In your dreams. Sorry? I said it could be something bigger than your dreams. Exactly. That's like what happened to me with becoming a mother. I thought it was the end of my life. And it turns out it's just the beginning of a whole new, wonderful, beautiful life that that I'm so grateful for now that I wish I could tell myself when I found out I was pregnant and save myself those months of anxiety and stress that I was feeling for no reason. Well, thanks so much. And I look forward to that book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. I see Kimberly with a hand up. Go ahead, Kimberly. Hi, Sage. Um, I just wanted Hi. to say thank you. Um, so I'm 38 years old now, and I lost my parents by the time I was 11. And wow. I remember um, I had gotten married, I had two kids, um, things were going good. But um, after the birth of my daughter, I started having panic attacks constantly. And it was to the point where I had to leave my teaching job for almost two years. And in that time, I started waking up like really early in the morning, like three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. And I had so much anxiety and I just ha I had to get, you know, get up and I would be doing the dishes. I'd be going for walks. And I was like, what is wrong with me? Why is my life falling apart? And I started Googling like, you know, how to deal with anxiety and all this stuff. And that's when I found your dad through YouTube. And I remember him saying, you know, when you wake up, do not go back to sleep. Do not go back to sleep. And I feel like in those times, 3.30 in the morning, I'd be listening to your dad. And it's the time where I felt most grateful for everything in my life, even the bad. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's all. I just wanted to thank you. Uh, it was, it was, it was after your dad that. I started making changes in my life and started, you know, really reassessing everything. And then everything just started clicking and signs started coming to me and it was all with your dad. And I remember being so excited, like, I need to like find this guy. I need to go to his lectures. And then I had found out he had already passed and I was devastated, but um, I just wanted to say thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. And I think that, um, you know, our lives are journeys. Like if it took you getting through that to get to this place where you're finding more meaning in your life, that, that was all on purpose too. But, uh, you know, go easy on yourself because yeah. it's, yeah, you have to be gentle with yourself and it's, you're not always going to be this high flying um, miracle magnet. You know, uh, maybe some people are, but I don't find myself to be that way at all. I get you, you feel things and you go through things. It's just returning to that place as much as you can and making it a habit. And I think you're doing a beautiful job at that, you know, being open to other ways of healing and um, coming to terms with circumstances in your life that sound really difficult. So I think that's thank beautiful. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Love you, that was beautiful. So what we do to um, end each of our meetings, is we do this prayer uh 
So if everybody could join with me, maybe close your eyes. We reach out and uh, we pretend that we're grabbing each other's hands and locking hands if you can. Um, so we dedicate the merit of this meeting to all of those awakening at this precious time. May our efforts to better ourselves help shift the planetary consciousness from fear into love. May this energy ripple out into the world and awaken those with closed hearts, illuminate closed minds, and inspire all to live within the presence of compassion and generosity.